whether you have it right there in front of you or on your phone or wherever you're looking at God's Word, and open it to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 1. Mark, chapter number 1. Back in November, when I was thinking about uh, the direction of uh, where I would be looking in God's Word in the beginning of the year, I, I began to think at, uh, of all the things that had happened in 2020, and December actually uh, hit me uh, personally very hard. It was a very uh, trying time in, in my life, and uh, I was very grateful. I'd already, um, God had already laid on my heart that we needed to talk about uh, our quiet time, a time of meeting with God and a, a time where God could uh, lift up our spirits. And I thought, if, of all the things that have happened to us in 2020, we definitely need our Lord to lean upon and to guide us and to direct us, and we need that time with Him. And then, uh, as the, the year began and I began to look at these things, uh, I began to see, actually with more value, probably than I ever have, of these things that, if we're not careful, we'll just take them for granted, things that we've learned at one point in time in our life and were very significant to us, but maybe if we're not careful, we'll put them on a shelf somewhere. I, I don't know how long ago it was, but I, I, I heard this, and I guess all of my adult life, uh, I've heard this mantra, the first job of a leader is to define reality, is to define reality. If you're a general and you're leading an army into war, you may have all the battle plans out there, but, but they say that once the first uh, gun is fired, all those battle plans go out the door. Because literally what you've got to do is you've got to be able to act in the reality of the moment. Now you may have some great scheme and and you may have great plans that you put together, but all those things can go astray in a, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And you, be, you better be able to define reality and do it quickly. If you go to a doctor, you're not going to a doctor just to, to have that doctor tell you what you think you want to hear. You're going to a doctor so that they can tell you what the reality of whatever is going on in your life. And then based upon that reality, that they can somehow uh, put together a plan to, to bring you back into help. If you, uh, a parent, can look at their kids at home and they can say, I have the most wonderful kids in the world and they're just so wonderful and those, they're, just, they're just great and everything about them. But then the principal calls and said, uh, little Johnny, uh, we, you, you need to come down here. We need to talk. And you go down there and say, oh, my, my, my child is a, a perfect angel and the, principal say maybe a fallen angel you know and he'll take you to that place where the spray paints on the wall and says here's your child with the spray paint on your hand what do you think about that well I, I just don't know what got into them they're just such a, a perfect child now listen you can be that type of parent if you want to but you need to understand that there is a reality that is there and and your job is not to ignore all the bad stuff but listen Embrace it. Embrace it and see it for what it is. Uh, I have this thing that I carry around with me all the time. It's called an insulin pump. My body no longer makes insulin, so this thing uh, has insulin in it, and it keeps up with what my blood sugar is 24-7. And, and I, when, if I'm going to eat something, I'll tell it how much to give me. Uh, they've got them now where they're going to just totally direct all of it for you, and I'm looking forward to that day, all right? But I'm still having to tweak mine. Now, every day, twice a day, every 12 hours, I don't take for granted that this thing is right. I don't just say, well, it was right yesterday. It was right last week. It, it, surely it's okay now. Twice a day, I go back to the old-fashioned, and I'll pull out the little thing and prick my finger and get a little drop of blood, and I'll check what my, my blood sugar is, and that little blood monitor will talk to my pump and it'll say, hey, I know what you think it is, but this is the reality of it. Now, if I'm going to be in charge of my diabetes, I really need to know what the truth is all the time. And, and when, I, when I take my little blood sugar and it talks to my pump, they call that recalibrating. Now, I know that in my life, and I dare say probably in your life as well, that we have a a tendency to, to 
we're prone to wander, prone to leave the one that we love. We're prone to be distracted and get off, get off kilter a little bit. We're, we're prone to, have you ever had a day where you said, man, that was just a wasted day. All day went by and I really never got anything accomplished that I wanted to get accomplished. And we know that, that if, if you're not in charge of your life, who is? I'll give you a word. You're the CEO of your life. Phil, you're the CEO of your life. Max, you're the CEO of your life. Not Sarah. She's the CEO of her life. Right now, she may want to say you're... Praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Phyllis. They're down there doing this, and I'm like, do I need to go to the altar or what? I didn't know what she was trying to say. Maybe I am the, the CEO of my life, but, uh, you know, I can't tell Lynn what to do. She's got to make, she's got to do what she's supposed to do. And I, some, I, I used this illustration once and someone said, well, I think Jesus is a CEO. No, he's the king of the world. Amen. But he lets you be in charge of the decisions you're going to make, the path that you're going to make, what you're going to think about today, where you're going to be distracted today. That's on you. And that's on me for my life. And, and I want you to know that that we need to define what our life is about. And we need to define what we would call a win in our life. You know, as a pastor, I used to could say, uh, for a church to be successful, this was what a win is. I tell you, 2020 kind of put that out there. I don't know really what a win is nowadays. I, I'm just looking at it and trying to, to be honest with things and, and say, this is what I think we could do. This is what I think we should do. And I just want to be faithful to the Lord and all that. Amen? And I, I, <clears throat> I think that if uh, decisions determine destiny, we need to make sure that we're doing what God would have us to do. Now, Jesus, he knew what his wins were in his life. And he lived them out every day. And I want us to talk about that for just a little bit. Take your Bible and look in Mark chapter number 1. Let me see if I can go through the this a little quicker than I did in the first service. In Mark chapter 1, in the 21st verse, <clears throat> Jesus went into the synagogue, and there he found a man who had an unclean spirit within him. And this unclean spirit spoke out, and verse 24 said, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? They knew who he was. Did you come to destroy us, it says? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now this is what uh, was once an angel in the presence of God that because of the pride in their life, because of the sin in their life, was cast out from the presence of God. Now Jesus came to earth. Now they're down here on earth. Now Jesus is down here on earth, but he's coming in human form. And they see him and they know him by his spirit. And they knew who he was. They said, Jesus, I know where you grew up, Jesus of Nazareth. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Why are you here? Are you here to hurt me? Are you here to come against me? And he literally said to this demon, hush, be quiet, and leave that person alone. This angel who had been in the presence of God, now they have no purpose in life. Now, Satan, their leader, is defined as one who goes out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And these demons are seeking to do the same thing. They don't have any purpose, so they come against those who love God. And they want to steal from us. They want to kill what God wants to build. They want to tear down and destroy that which adds value to our life. Now, I want you to know, God's wanting to do one thing in our life. They're wanting to do something else. And he cast this demon out. And in verse, it says in verse 27, they're all, they were all amazed about it. And they said, who is this person who has such uh, authority that speaks these new doctrines? That even the unclean spirits, they obey him. They were, when they saw Jesus, they saw the power of God but they really couldn't understand that power. And then look what it says in verse 28. Jesus' fame 
spread throughout all the region around Galilee. If you were a bystander, you would look at it and you'd say, Jesus was very successful. You would say, Jesus was doing, had a win in his life for the glory of God. So the next thing we know, they left the synagogue and they, they went down to uh, Simon and Andrew's house. And once they got there, they found out that, that Peter's mother-in-law had been sick with a fever. And they told Jesus about it. And Jesus just went in. Listen to this now. He just went in where she was, didn't say a word, didn't have to say a word. His spirit connected with God, knew the need, touched her, and healing occurred. Not just because he spoke it, but because he's God and his presence was there. And immediately she was healed, and she felt good, and she got up and she began to serve because that was her purpose was to serve. And, and everyone's amazed by it. Now look what this, look what it says here. <clears throat> At evening, verse 32, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Verse 33 is amazing. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Now, the Word of God does not exaggerate. Everybody left their house and went to Peter and Andrew's house because Jesus was there. They were drawn to the presence of Jesus. Every house empty, all the streets empty. Everybody was there because there was something that drew them there. The power of God was there. And they wanted to be in the presence of the power of God. Look what it says in verse 34. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases. Didn't matter what they had. Didn't matter what the sickness was. Jesus was powerful. Jesus could heal. And he said, and he did not allow, oh, excuse me, and he cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. It was important to him that they didn't tell everyone he was a son of God yet. They were letting him know. Everywhere he went, he would heal someone. And he'd tell them, y'all be quiet. Don't tell anyone. Because that was his plan. It got to the place where where Jesus could not even go out because the crowds were so, so much upon him. He could not even enter the cities because the crowds were so big. It hindered his ability to minister to people. Now, I would look at that as a bystander, and I'd say, man, that's, that's pretty successful. I mean, what if we had church and everybody in the city came because the the power and the presence of God was here. And they came here because they wanted to meet with the presence of God. Bradley, I don't know what a win is today, but I call that a win. I'd say that'd be successful. I'd say that'd be a good thing, wouldn't you? Look what happens next. Verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. What did he do? After a long day, he had gone to synagogue and ministered there. He went to Andrew's house, ministered there. As a matter of fact, people found out where he was. They just kept coming, and he kept ministering, and they kept coming, and he kept healing, and he kept casting out demons. You know he was encouraging people. You know he was teaching the Word of God to the people. He was trying to do everything. And I tell you, ministry will just take all the energy out of you, like an old wash rag, and you get wrung out, and you're tired and weary, and everybody wants something from you, and you think, it's time to say amen. It's time to get a little rest. And you think he'd get a good night's rest. But something was so important to him that he woke up early in the morning before anything else of the day. W.A. Criswell said that you needed to, first thing in the day is to begin your day with God. And for the 60 years that he pastored, First Baptist Church of Dallas. He made that his practice that he would begin his day with God. W.A. Uh, excuse me. Henry Blackaby, 
when he wrote the book, Experiencing God, he, uh, he, he said that he uh, would wake up early in the mornings to spend time with God. Lynn and I actually had an, uh, an encounter with him. We had a, a privilege to go and be with him, and what, about 20 other people were in the room there with him and his wife. And, and he said, he said uh, when he began, uh, he would get, get up at 6.30 in the morning. And then he would find that, that he, could, he needed more time with God before he began his day. And then he would go to 5 o'clock in the morning. And then he went to 4 o'clock. And then he went to 3. He said, this was his words to us. He looked dead at me. And he said, now I'm having to get up at 3 o'clock so I can spend time with God before I begin my day. He, he would set his alarm clock across the room so he, would, so he would have to get up and go. And he said when he heard the alarm, he said he knew he had a date with God. And he did not want to miss that time. Now when we began all of this, I said that we were going to follow a pattern that Jesus would place before us. That Jesus had some spiritual disciplines in his life that he did. And that if it was good enough for Jesus, it ought to be good enough for us. If it was something that he thought was important, truly it's something we would see as important as well. And here after this long day, you would, you would have said, well, what he needs is rest. He's human. And his body is weak. But he had a greater priority. So he intentionally got up. And it says, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight. How much is a long while? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was 6.30, maybe it was 5, maybe it was 4, maybe it was 3. I don't know. But on that day, he got up and he spent time with God. He went out. He didn't stay where everybody else was. He found a solitary place. I always heard one plus God equals a majority. So we need to go to that place, listen, get everybody else out, get everything in your mind out, and just... In a solitary place, let's meet with God. Look what it says. And he went there and he prayed. He spoke to God. He communed with God. I've always said God's only a whisper away. And when I speak, I have his attention. And when he speaks, I pray he has my attention. And when my heart is weary and I need to pour it out to God, God is there to meet me there and, and embrace me. And He cares and He loves. But when He speaks, because I care, listen, because I love, because it's important, because it matters, I don't want to miss out on that. Before He wanted to do anything else, now look what happens. Verse 36, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. So they wake up in the morning. Where is Jesus? I don't know. Have you seen him? I hadn't seen him. Well, he's not here. I don't know where he's at. Well, let's go find him. And they begin to search and look here and look there. And when they finally found them, look, listen to what they said to him. They said, when, every, when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. It almost sounds like there's a little bit of an accusation. Where you been, Lord? We woke up, you weren't there. You made us hunt for you. Couldn't you have left a note? Couldn't you? Why are you out here? What, what's so important? Jesus totally ignored all of that. Look in verse 38. He said, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also because for this purpose... I have come forth. It's not like he wasn't doing it. The day before, he spent all day long ministering the good news of the kingdom of God to all the people that were there, sharing the love of God. But he thought important. Listen, oh, I pray that we hear the call of God calling us to himself. He thought it important to once again get up early so that he could reconnect with God. He could recalibrate with God. I do this all the time. I hope you do too. Lord, here I am. Here is your servant. Your servant is listening. Speak, O oh Lord. Your servant is listening. Lord, if I move to the, to the right, bring me back. 
Lord, if I'm, if I'm moving away from you to the left, bring me back to the center of your will that I can match up with the plumb line of the Spirit of the living God. Oh God, if you say yes, may I not argue with you, but may it be yes. Lord, if you say no, may it be no for me. And Lord, if you say go, I will go. But Lord, if you say not yet, give me the wisdom not to argue with you, but to wait patiently with you. Lord, I don't want to get ahead of you. I don't want to walk behind you. I don't want to follow my agenda. Lord, let me hear fresh from you. I don't know about you, but I don't know everything. I don't. And I don't know what the day's going to hold for me, but he does. And I don't know all the plans. I'm not going to be so presumptuous to think that I know everything. So I'll get before God, and I'll let him open my heart, and, and I'll seek to hear from him as I pray, and he can hear from me. And, and it becomes a give and a take. It becomes a communication. It is a relationship. It is a blessed relationship. So he went away to recalibrate. Take your Bible and look in the third chapter. It's not in the Gospel of Mark. It is in Matthew and Luke. In Mark chapter 3, verse 13, we see that Jesus is calling the disciples, those apostles, to himself. He would call them out and they became that, that 12 that would follow him. But in Matthew and Luke, it tells us that before that morning, when he would call those disciples out, listen to me now, he went up to a mountain once again, but this time he prayed all night. Now, if anybody could presume to know the will of God, it would have been Jesus. But it's such an important decision, a critical decision, crossroads to call these disciples he went out and he prayed all night long has anybody ever prayed all night long has anybody ever just cried out all night long walked up and down the streets out in the field out in the place with the moonlight coming down upon you outside maybe inside kneeling down by your couch sitting with your Bible, listening to the Lord? Have you poured out your heart all night? Listen, Jesus thought it was so important. Why should we think it less important? Spending time with God was a priority, first priority. So then he comes down and he calls those apostles, those disciples to himself. And then look in verse 20. Then the multitude came together again. Now, how, many, how much is a multitude? In Scripture, it may be a hundred to a few hundred. Sometimes it would be a thousand or a few thousand. There are some times that they would say multitude, and it would be 10,000 or more. We don't know how many was there, but it says, Then the multitude came together so that they could not so much as eat bread. Do you think Jesus with all these people around here, with all these people coming against him, do you think he could have said to them, hey guys, I need to go spend my quiet time. Will y'all leave me alone for a little bit? I need to go back in my office and spend time. If he had not spent his time before, he would not have had time. If you're waiting for a convenient time to spend time with God, it may not ever come. You may need to have a time that you set aside as a date for God to hear and say, here I am, Lord. Let's talk and let's meet together. I praise God for church, amen? I praise God that we have the encouragement of the group of people gathering together. But you know, I've always heard that one plus God is a majority. And coming together in that time with God, you're, you have everything that you need at that moment at your disposal, being with him. Look what it says. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he's out of his mind. 
Could you imagine those closest to him, his own people coming to him, family coming to him and said, you got to quit this. People are always going to be okay with what you're doing as long as what you're doing agrees with what they think. But if you ever get to the place where you're doing something that's different from the norm, they'll leave you in droves. I hope you're good with that. If we say one plus God is a majority, I hope you're okay with that kind of a quorum. If you're only going to do what you do in life because of a fear of others and what they're going to say and think, or what you want to hear from others, and you need their approval, you may never find the perfect, sweet, holy, warm, anointed will of God for your life. You need sp time to spend time with God, listen to me now, so that you can stand with God when the difficulties of life come. Look in verse 22. As soon as this happens, the scribes, the people of the Word of God, supposedly the, the people who knew the Old Testament better than anybody else, these scribes come, and, and they look at Jesus and says, he has Beelzebub. He is demon-possessed. The word is the Lord of the flies. That's a, a term that was used of Satan. He's got Satan. And, and listen else what they say. And, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. When Jesus heard that, he just stopped and paused, and he, he gave them a word. Look what he says in verse 23. Hear this word. He called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If, if Satan is the head of this kingdom of demons, but he's casting out demons, how can their work go on? It is said of Satan that he came to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to come into your life and steal all the good that God wants there. He wants to kill all the productive things that God wants to do in your life. He wants to destroy all the things that you build up and stand in the glory of God. He wants all those things gone from your life. So if he's got demons, listen now, if he's got his emissaries working and, and, and empowering your life, why would he kick that demon out? It doesn't make sense. He says, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. Every kingdom that has two divisions in it has a problem. Every church where there are two factions again in, again in that church, I promise you there will be loss. When one group is warring against another group, somebody is going to lose. Some, it doesn't matter if you're a country, if you're divided against yourself. In your personal life, if you have allegiances to God, but you have other things in your life where you have allegiances to yourself and the things of this world, you've got a problem. Jesus said these words, He who is not for me is against me. You're either on my team or you're a hindrance. You are either the light of the world or you're false light. A hypocrite was described as someone with a false face. He says, just lay all that down and you can have all of the blessings and the anointing and the depth of the things of God. But when we allow part of our life and we give part of our life to God, listen now, and we give part of it to other things, we're a house divided. Now, I got us down to verse 27. I think verse 27 is the most important verse. Are you listening? Hear what the Word of God says. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Now, he wants to steal. He wants to kill and destroy. But if he comes to your home 
and you've got the gun, and you're right there, and you click, click, you cocked it, uh, hey, he's going to say, hey, I'll come another day. He wants to come a day when he can catch you off guard. He wants to come at a day when you're not looking for him to come. And he wants to come at a time that he can bind you up. But no weapon formed against me will prosper. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Right? So he can't overcome me. As a matter of fact, he is under my feet and he needs to stay there. So what he knows is he, if he's going to come to my house, somehow he's going to bind me up. So he dangles in front of me a carrot to lead me astray. He can't bind me, but I can bind myself. He can't overpower me, but he can place before me things that will literally strip the presence and the power of God away from me. I heard something this week that Absolutely blew me away. How many of y'all have a phone? I said last week they call them a smartphone and phone, and not all of them are that smart. Amen. But how many of y'all have social media on your phone? I was told this week, and I, I actually, you know, I don't believe everything you read, so I wanted to do a little research on it. And they said that the average person touches their phone. Over 2,000 times a day. That there are some that will touch it over 5,000 times a day. There are people that will get on Facebook or other social medias and they'll spend two to four hours a day. They say that there are, and by the way, how many of y'all have done that? I'll confess, I have. Am I the only one in here that's telling the truth? Maybe two, three, four, five. Oh, that's like the election. We're finding boats everywhere. <laughs> Amen? And, and we'll spend all this time before it. And isn't it funny how time can just fly by? And we're just, our thumbs are doing all the work. Lynn and I uh, met a friend of mine in commerce this week on Friday evening. He's uh, going to uh, do a wedding, and he was going to do some premarital counseling. He, he called me, he said, uh, Hey, man, I need some help. So uh, I made him down there, and I gave him some material, to, uh, some tests to help them find out what this couple would need, you know. And, and, and we met, and we talked together a little bit. Friday night, y'all know it's date night. So uh, we went over to uh, Out to Eat. We went to Outback. And um, we really, we met our friend. He, he couldn't, he was coming from Atlanta, so he could only meet at 6 o'clock. We left about 6.30. We talked about 30 minutes. So we left at 6.30, which is not a good time to go to Outback. On Friday night. So we get in there and they tell my wife it would be so long. By the way, they lied. <laughs> Amen. So we're standing there waiting because uh, I'm smelling the steak. And my stomach is, you know, and it's date night and I'm talking to Lynn, you know. And, we're just, and I look and beside us, there, there's this group of six. And they're all there. And I looked and every one of the six had their phone. And I look over here in this group, and they all got their phone. Now, folks, this is not a sermon against phones. It's not a, a sermon against those things. It's not even a sermon against social media. But I'm telling you, that thing is not the CEO of your life. We went, they finally sat us down, and I looked over at this table. Three people. Mark, you and I remember, we remember when we'd go out on a date, we'd be talking to somebody, and we'd actually talk to somebody. Amen? I mean, that's what we wanted to do. And I look over, and there's, there's three people in a booth. I mean, they're not socially distanced. They're right there together, close. And all three people had a phone doing this. And I'm, I said all that to say this, something's out of whack. Because honestly, I think it happened without them realizing it. Somebody did a loop around the outside that we're not conscious of to bring time stealers into our life. 
And I'm worried and I'm afraid. They say, young people today, if, they, if, they, if nothing changes and they continue this pattern, they will spend 10 years of their life on social media. Now, Satan can't come in and control. But without us knowing it, has he put things into our life that are sneaking in and taking our time away? Parents, I raised three kids close together. And I, I am not against baseball or basketball or football or soccer or wrestling or tennis or lacrosse or cross country or band or cheerleading or dance team or uh, chorus. I'm not against the drama club. I'm not against the riding club. I'm not against the chess club. I'm not against any of those clubs. I think, amen, hallelujah, find your thing. Good. Amen. But those parents, when I hear them say, I don't want my children to miss out. I'm grateful that my mom and dad brought me to church even when I didn't know the value of it. I'm grateful that there are things that I have inbred in my life that I learned when I was young because I, they valued it for me. And I will tell you, I used to play sports. I used to be a little bit of an athlete. But I, I don't play football anymore. I don't play baseball anymore. I'm not on the swim team. I'm not on the drama team. I'm not even in the choir. I, I just do what I do. And I, I will tell you that a lot of things that, that parents think that their kids can't do without because they don't want them to miss out on an opportunity or nothing but stealing the future of their walk with God. Now, parents are going to probably hear that, and they're going to say, pastors, all he cares about is church. No, I'm more narrow-minded than that. All I care about is God. <laughs> and I'm all right with a, an athlete who loves God. I'm all right with a, a, cur, a person who plays a, minister, a musical instrument that loves God. I'm not, I am grateful for those who go hunting and fishing and know God. I'm grateful for those people who go shopping and, and antiquing, but no God. Why is it that all those other things, because Satan has brought them into our life and he's binding us up. Then he can come in and steal and kill and destroy because we've given him the keys to our life. When we need to prioritize time with God, let me give you an illustration. Jesus used this illustration a lot. He would talk about the farmer. He always was talking about the shepherds and talking about the farmers. Well, let's talk about the farmer. He has an opportunity. He has land. He doesn't go sleep. He goes to work. And he, he gets up and do the, does the hard work. He gets the, the soil ready. All that hardened soil where the seed can't penetrate, he he, he plows it up. And he, he gets the rocks out of the way so he can plow deep and the seed, the roots of the seed can go deep down. And as he plants and as he is growing, he'll come back and work and get rid of the weeds. You know, that's not a glamorous job. Farming's an everyday job. Farming is a hard job. People don't come and just... Uh, look at your field that looks barren out there and say, you're doing a wonderful job. Because what they're looking for is for harvest time. But I'm here to tell you, unless they do the day-by-day -day work, they're not going to have a harvest time. If you're looking for the end result, you need to go spend time every day. A farmer needs to be okay with being a farmer. Listen to me now. Here's the thing that you need to hear. He needs to fall in love with the process of becoming a farmer. Doing it every day. Doing the process of being a farmer every day. The book of Proverbs talks about the ant who goes out every day and does the work. Morgan is in our service this morning. 
She's just finished her book. She's written a book. We all love her for it. We're all pulling for her. We want it to be a, a, a bestseller. All my ministry, Lynn can testify to this, people have come to me and said, you need to write. And from time to time I've said, you know what, I, I, you're right, I need to write. And Lynn's seen me do it, I'll get over there and I'll, I'll spend, I'll, I'll block out some time and I'll spend six hours writing. And then six weeks later I'll think about it again. And, and I was talking with someone and they, they said, they gave me a little bit of process of how to do the writing, but then they said this that was very important. They said, you need to, to make a goal and you need to plan for that goal. Maybe you only need to write five pages a week, but then they said this, fall in love with the process of writing. If, you, if you're okay with the process, maybe you only get five pages a week, but after 10 weeks, you'll have 50 pages. By the end of the year, you'll have a book. Instead of looking back on it and saying, I wish I had or I regret that I didn't. Every day, I get a life, and I'm the CEO of my life. And every day, I get the opportunity to do with that day what I'm supposed to do. And yes, we have jobs that we do. We have places we need to, to go. We have obligations we need to meet. But spending it first with God. Now, I'm not so le When I was a young preacher, I could tell everybody how to do everything. And for me personally, I, I need to have my quiet time at the beginning of my day because I want God with me as I follow my day. But I've had people come to me and say, can I do my quiet time in the afternoon? Can I do my quiet time in the evening? There's no bad time to spend time with God. I'm going to say that again. No bad time to spend time with God. Jesus just thought it important to spend time at the beginning of the day. That doesn't mean he didn't have a a little break in the afternoon that he didn't spend time with God then too. But you better prioritize it. It's a process. How blessed. Have y'all had any difficulties? Anybody had any hardships? Anybody have any questions? Anybody got questions? Anybody, you know, I, I wish I could, I wish I knew what to do. I wish I, wish I had some time with the Father. Seek after him. He'll be found. Draw close to him. He'll draw close to you. Open up your heart. He'll open up the treasures of the doors of heaven. Heaven can come down. and Glory can fill your soul. Or maybe you just need to crawl up into his lap and let him put his arms around you. Maybe there's some things that you need to tell him that nobody else needs to hear. Maybe you need to talk to him before you talk to that other person that you need to talk to. Maybe there's some things where you, he can just give you some guidance so you open up the Word of God and with him. Things start to jump off the page. And you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And every time he says, don't, say, all right, Lord, help me today not to do that. And every time you see that this is what he's supposed to do, say, yes, Lord, I, it doesn't feel right within me, but I love you and I trust you and I, I want to follow you. So, Lord, help me to do this today. No perfect people in this room. No perfect people watching online. Just people seeking to draw closer to the holy God who already loves them completely. What will what we miss out on? If Lynn came running to me and said, the phone's for you, I might say, who is it? Y'all ever do that? If she said, it's God Almighty, wouldn't I run to it? Why is it that God has to chase us when we're supposed to be God chasers, chasing him? Do we want to live in, with intentionality or do we want to live with regret? I do not want to give the devil the keys to my house to come in and plunder 
but I want to take back what he's stolen. I want to build back what he's destroyed by the power of God every day. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, we love you. We praise you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement of it. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity today where we can just spend time with you. Lord, I love it when we can come together as a church. I love to see the smiles and the looks on faces. I love to hear their encouraging words. But Lord, I want to look up at you and I want to see a smile upon your face. I want to feel your breath upon me, Holy Spirit. I want to hear your words. I want my heart to melt. I want your will to be done. Lord, I want you to call my name when you see a mission, a task that needs to be done. Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be strong, Lord. Someone may need someone to lean upon today, and I can let them lean upon me as they lean upon you. Oh, Lord, help us to be the people that we need to be. Lord, let it begin today. Lord, may we prioritize it. May nothing get in the way. Grow us, grow a healthy crop. And Lord, let it begin now and let it happen every day. Teach us the wisdom of the farmer for your honor and glory, for your will to be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.